Who are we without storytelling? That is the last question that needs answering. In the previous episodes we discussed how stories are fundamentally different from reality, and how, despite this difference, we increasingly began to project the structures of heroic adventures onto our own lives, began to use it as a predictive template, as a way to set expectations for the course of our lives. We saw how the original meaning and purpose of the hero's journey became somewhat twisted because of this, how it became a pressure for people to compete with each other for ever more exciting adventures, how it became a source of serious disillusionment for people whose lives turned out differently than they expected them to, who didn't achieve the success they were after, who didn't go through the meaningful transformation they wanted, or who didn't find the love they so desperately needed. We also saw how the hero's journey can be corrupted by groups of people who use it to forge their own cosmic destiny, who feel so entitled to a heroic adventure that they victimize others in the process. While in episode 2 I focused on the history of western society, this obviously goes for all cultures which have their own history of heroic adventures, and therefore their own views and biases that create heroes out of some and victims out of others. Are you ready to fight? Yes, sir! Are you ready to fight? Yes, sir! It left me wondering if we are not better off without heroic adventures, without those structures that only simplify a complex reality. But is that even a possibility? Is storytelling not the foundation of who we are? Is it not a result of the way we naturally experience the world, and therefore maybe even rooted into the larger principles of the universe? In this final episode, let's return to the center of things, to our own experience of the world, and of ourselves. Let's explore what can be reconstructed out of the deconstructed. Let's see if we can find the essence of who we are without storytelling. Not just to see who we are not, but also who we can be. Just because our lives do not unfold according to the neatly confined and predictive structure of the hero's journey, that doesn't mean we don't experience our lives adventurously. The existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre explored this subject in his famous book Nausea, in which the main character reflects on the adventures he experienced in his life and wonders what it really meant to have experienced them. While he is certain he has gone on adventures, he points out that many of the things he considered to be vital parts of these adventures, such as unfamiliar places and mysterious strangers, weren't adventurous in themselves. Foreign countries are not foreign to the people who live there, and what is a stranger to one can be a close acquaintance of another. He therefore concluded that the content of the adventure does not matter, it is the form that does. We turn events into adventures by experiencing them as such. German sociologist George Simmel had a similar analysis and argued that the adventure, or rather the experience of the adventure, simply results from the process of familiarizing yourself with the unfamiliar. A new place, a new person, a new event or activity. As such, the adventure is always, to greater or lesser extent, transformative. You engage in something new which then adds, removes, or otherwise changes some part of your being. As you can see, so far this experience closely resembles the hero in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, who goes into the unknown to eventually become a master of two worlds. Good morning! Morning! Another way to look at the adventure is as a distinct way of perceiving time. When we go through our day-to-day -day life, time is somewhat predictable, structured. Office hours, dinner time, night time, we generally have some notion of what we'll be doing during certain hours. The adventure then is a break from this structure, and invokes the uncertainty and excitement of new possible futures. 
In this sense, a smile from a stranger could suggest the beginning of a love story that will define the rest of your life. Or inversely, an extreme sports adventure could mean a swift ending to it. Either way, to experience an adventure is to perceive time differently. It makes the future feel uncertain, undefined, thereby making the present moment more immediate, urgent. An adventure, however, doesn't truly become an adventure until it is completed and can be recounted as a story. For only then can we definitively distinguish all the hypothetical adventures, all the potential futures, from the one that actually happened. Only then can we determine the adventure's plot, the way in which the different experiences are connected to each other. And only then can we see the causal relations, how events impacted others and became transformative. As the existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, Life must be lived forwards, but can only be understood backwards. As such, no matter how you look at it, our experiences always have a twofold significance. First, there is the initial experience of something, the strangeness of an unfamiliar event, the excitement of meeting someone new, or the pain following a failure. And then there's the meaning that those experiences take on as we retell them in a story which has the power to change how we initially perceived them. For example, the one's admirable ambition of a partner might be recontextualized as selfish egoism as the relationship falls apart into tragedy. Or the initial failure might become a stepping stone to a more meaningful victory and give the story a triumphant ending after all. Here too we see the work of Joseph Campbell reflected as the elements of the hero's journey also have a double significance. There is the event in itself, and there is the larger meaning of that event as it becomes recontextualized in the hero's journey as a whole. The only thing is, when it comes to the stories of our own lives, we are both author and character. In other words, we are telling our stories as we are living them which makes it pretty difficult to effectively capture our lives into one adventurous story, and especially into one that fits the exact structure of the hero's journey. Because if our stories are ongoing as long as we are able to give shape to them, to change them, when do the individual experiences of our lives take on their definitive meaning? When can you say that you have truly experienced a full adventure? Even though we can experience life adventurously, for that feeling to become an actual adventure it seems that we ourselves need to transform it into one. But this is easier said than done, because while the potential for adventure is limitless, so it seems is the potential to reframe it. Whether we're trying to tell the stories of our entire lives or just a tiny adventure within it, how do we give significance to that which is constantly capable of evolving? Just look at how often we believe that we are at the start of a grand adventure. I'm, this is Patterson Bus 23, I have a situation. Only for it to become something that just happened, and then passed without any discernible consequences. You acted so heroically. <laughs> or on the contrary, how often have we made life-changing decisions that seemed so minuscule at the moment that we didn't realize their importance until decades later? And even then, can we truly trace those decisions back to their source? Are the choices we make not tied to countless invisible threats? Threats that have been unfolding and spinning around since long before we were born? The same can be asked when it comes to our collective adventures. When does a war begin? Is it the moment it is declared, or is that just a consequence of a story that had already begun much earlier? What is the history of a nation, a people? Where does our story begin? And, just as important, where does it end? What is often missing from our adventures, as opposed to adventures in stories, is what Jean-Paul Sartre called perfect moments. Moments that mark definitive resolutions in our stories. Right. 
We see such moments in invasion stories, for example, and in their often used trope called the mothership. The mothership is an object or figure that represents the leader of the invading force, and that, when destroyed, instantly disables all invading forces, thereby marking a clear and conclusive victory for our heroes. We also see perfect moments in romantic stories, in which the grand climactic kiss is implied to carry the rest of the relationship without further conflict. And we see them in the form of plot twists, moments in which seemingly unconnected threats are suddenly revealed to be intertwined, in which chaos and confusion are suddenly replaced with order and understanding, moments in which it all comes together. In real life, Large-scale conflicts, personal relations and quests for meaning are rarely defined or bookended by singular moments, especially ones that we experience as such while they are happening. When it comes to historical conflicts, we can define certain milestones in hindsight. The day of surrender, the signing of a declaration. But for those who have actually lived the story, it's probably hard to pinpoint the exact moment they felt things were back to normal. Take even our current health crisis. It is unlikely this will be over after one defining victory, after one clearly perceivable moment, and is instead more likely to be resolved with a slow, almost inconspicuous return to a state that can be called ordinary. Looking at our relationships, here too we will surely find important moments. The first kiss, the wedding day, and other moments of great personal significance. But again, these are almost never truly as definitive as the majority of romantic stories we see in films. There are some interesting counterexamples, however. The film Before Midnight, for example, shows how a couple, years after them finding each other in a dreamlike romance, have to face the reality of what it really means to be in a relationship. If you want true love, then this is it. This is real life. It's not perfect, but it's real. In doing so, it comes much closer to what relationships are like in real life. A reality in which nothing can be taken for granted. In which every experienced moment can be redefined. Or even fall apart. And about the reality of plot twists or moments of grand revelations, well, to quote a pastor from Synecdoche, New York, everything is more complicated than you think. You only see a tenth of what is true. We may create some understanding of things over time, but what is this really if not just a temporary veil of wisdom over what remains a fundamentally unknowable reality? A brief moment of stillness in what remains an ever-changing story. They're all leads of their own stories. They have to be given their due. Is a fully formed, fully resolved story then nothing more than an ideal that's forever out of reach? Is this the real difference between stories and reality? Are we doomed to a state of perpetual storytelling? of continuous narration without closure. To again refer to Synecdoche, New York, are we like Caleb, who spent years on his grand play that continues to grow bigger and bigger until he eventually passes away in the ruins of his unfinished creation? Can nothing we do be set in stone? There seems to be an unresolvable conflict between constantly experiencing the potential for adventure and actually being able to resolve one. The easy answer is to search for closure, for absoluteness, on a larger level. We can say that our stories begin when we are born and end after we die. A clear beginning, a clear end. But it's not exactly as simple as that, because even after we die, the entirety of our lives might be recontextualized within a greater story, beginning with that of our family, our country, all the way to human civilization and existence as a whole. And this brings us to some larger metaphysical issues. For there is one question we also haven't really addressed, 
The question of why there is a monomyth, why we tell stories according to the same hero's journey. Is it simply because that is how we create meaning, how we give structure to our experiences? Or is it because that is how we perceive the structure that is already there? In other words, does it originate within us? Or is it a pre-existing principle of the universe? My shepherd, bring us to your eternal light. It's a question that leads us into the territory of religion, the belief that there is a grand cosmic story, one that is authored by a higher force or divine being. The existence of such a creator would certainly resolve the difference between stories and reality, as it would give our lives, our existence, the intentionality, structure and definitiveness of the hero's journey. It will give us something to live for as our lives become purposeful journeys from and towards this great creator. Joseph Campbell's own resolution has a similar type of cosmic determinism as he advises us to follow our bliss. If you follow your bliss, he wrote, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting for you, and the life that you are to be living is the one you are living. While not explicitly religious, Campbell here does seem to imply that there is someone or something that has laid out a path for us. One that we need only put ourselves on for a meaningful life. It's a solution that's worked well for many people, and still does. But personally speaking, ending all this with a leap of faith doesn't satisfy me. Because even if there is some cosmic plot, even if the tracks are already laid out, I still wouldn't know how I fit in. I wouldn't know how to let it guide my choices, my story. I could try to follow my bliss, but that just seems like an invitation to mistake fake intuition for absolute knowledge. In the end, I would feel like a replicant in the original Blade Runner, chasing a creator for answers I'm not going to get. You were made as well as we could make you, but not to last. Even if there was some purpose, I could never attain it. The path laid out for me would remain obscured. And I would still die with the feeling that my life was but a mere collection of moments, incoherent, unresolved, waiting to be lost in time. Like tears. So, what is the way out of this? For while it might be frustrating to try and live our lives as heroic adventures, to fit our experiences into clear and cohesive stories, so too is the opposite. If we assume our lives to be without any kind of structure, what is left but pointlessness? But even if that were the case, we would still act in defiance of that fate. We still naturally create patterns, constructions, storylines. It's why today we are roughly the same person as the day before, and the day before that, and so on. It's why we can connect with others and get a sense of who they are. If um, they're responding to your work and your work is really personal, then reading you is another way of meeting you, isn't that right? There seems to be an essence within us that simply refuses nihilism, and that should mean something too. It is therefore that Jean-Paul Sartre proposed a sort of middle ground between the nihilism of a life without the structures of stories and the frustration of a life that's too restricted by them. Basically, he suggests that we let go of the idea of coherence, of predetermined structures, in favor of creativity. That we take our story into our own hands and really become our own authors. We've discussed how heroic adventures can put a pressure on the way we should live our lives, but they also put a pressure on us. We base so much of our identities on collected ideas of what it means to be someone, what it means to be a man, a woman, what it means to be strong, to be weak, to be attractive, to be ugly, to be adventurous, to be boring. And in doing so, we create boundaries to maintain coherence. We start acting according to the somebody we've cultivated ourselves to be. And we can become afraid to act out of character. 
both in the eyes of others as well as to ourselves. If we truly become the authors of our own lives, the adventure could mean to try and be someone new, to become who we would otherwise never dare to be, to break away from the patterns and norms that kept us in place, that kept us small. As for why, well, the existential philosopher Albert Camus argued that life is inherently absurd, as we've seen it's full of conflicts, limitations and contradictions. But there's also a freedom, or at least a feeling of freedom within us. Although it's not the kind of freedom that allows us to transcend the absurdity of existence, it is one that allows us to shape our experience of it. It is the part of us that realizes we will never truly understand our cosmic purpose, that accepts it is, for all intents and purposes, meaningless. But it is also the part that then sees a sunset, or a smile, a tiny glimpse of something beautiful, and feels that it is not. It is, however, not a matter of rationality or logic, it's something deeper. Perhaps that's the bliss Joseph Campbell was talking about. It is the part of us that doesn't just want to exist, it wants us to live. It is the part that tells us that if I have to create my own meaning, I'm gonna create as much of it as I can. If I have to tell my own story, I'm going to fill it with beauty. It is the part of us that wants to savor every moment, be it exciting and adventurous, or quiet and mundane, that wants to experience life, all of it, with passion, with intensity, the part that wants us, as Camus put it, to live to the point of tears. Perhaps this is why we turn to the same stories, to help give shape to our own, to enrich them, to deepen our capacity to experience the beauty around us, to give us courage and strength, to prepare us for the hardship, the suffering and loss. After all, that's the only journey that's shared between all of us, the struggle that we all have in common, an effort that is nothing short of heroic. As much as the hero's journey has come to be seen as an individualistic concept, a way to give shape and transform our own lives, I think that, in the end, what it really does, or should do, is connect us to each other, to make us compassionate and patient and supportive towards our fellow human beings following the same journey. To my big brother George, the richest man in town. As George Bailey realizes at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, no one is a failure who has friends. And what better way is there to become close to someone if not to open yourself up without fear or anxiety, and in doing so, invite them to do the same. If we let go of all the ideas of who we should be, and instead focus on who we can be, who we want to be, it can truly be a wonderful life, because by embracing ourselves as storytellers, but letting go of the structures that demand cohesion and limit our creativity, what we would be left with is freedom for ourselves and for others. Freedom to break free. Freedom to be.
I thank you all for following me on this three-part journey, and also want to extend my gratitude to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this final episode. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that encrypts your online activity to secure you from data harvesters, hackers, and other unwanted intrusions. It also lets you access all kinds of content that might be blocked because of regional restrictions. I've been using ExpressVPN for about two years now and I've been really satisfied with it. It's easy to use, the internet speed is great and so is the customer support. It's been especially useful for me to access Netflix in the United States, which has a more expansive library than the Netflix in my own country. If you want to try ExpressVPN for yourself, go to expressvpn.com slash lsoo and find out how you can get three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash lsoo to get three months free.